Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, stakeholder advisory committee meeting number three. Uh, today, we have some new members with us I'd like to welcome. Uh, and Eve, if I get your name wrong, please correct me, but uh, we have Eve Mason Marcus. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, from the prosecutor's office, we have Eric Ritchie. Uh, we have Teresa, ba Teresa Bostetter. And then from the public defender's office, we have uh, Stark Ballas and Maya Banyo. They're sharing that seat. So welcome, welcome to the group, everybody. We uh, totally are glad you're here with us today. Uh, today, we are looking at behavioral health and some of the uh, research and work that the Health Department Behavioral Health Gap Analysis Team has done, and they're going to be presenting that to us today. I uh, want to thank them for all the work that they put in over the past few months. It's been, uh, it's been a long road, but they uh, have done a lot of great work. Our fourth meeting will be in July. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me. I think it's July 12th or 13th or somewhere around there, mid-July. We're going to be, this will be a more interactive uh, session in which we will starting to be discussing what we've learned so far and how that applies to our work creating the needs assessment. And then the fifth meeting, we haven't got a date for uh, yet, but that will be focused on the facilities and what we're looking at in terms of, 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 a, of a new facility, what that might look like. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our facilitator, Holly O'Neill from Crossroads Consulting. Thanks, Holly, for being here. Yay, thank you, Perry. Wonderful, well, welcome everybody. So glad we're able to be together. And um, Kathy, if you could pop up the PowerPoint, that would be great. And we'll get started on, on the agenda for today. Uh, the these um, first things, which if you came in a little bit late, uh, it does help if you can make sure that your name is showing. So you just click on the there's some little buttons, usually little dots, and you can just make it so you have your name up there and keep your video on if you can and keep yourself muted. So just 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 a little reminder for the Zoom protocols. And then let's go to the agenda and the and kind of the framework for our day. Go ahead. So just a reminder that this is what Barry was just speaking to. We have some meetings coming up here. We're gonna do a work session in July. We really wanna make sure that we can integrate what we've heard so far and really have time for open discussion. And then we'll figure out uh, the schedule later on to to talk about facilities and the needs assessment. And I'm also so pleased we have Jennifer Moon here with us today, who's uh, working on actually writing, <laughs> trying to craft the document as we go and listening for the themes that are emerging. So next slide, please. So our agenda for today, uh, Stephen is gonna talk a little bit of about why we're here so that we can just um, kind of remember what we're doing because there's space between our meetings and, and there's so much information. So he's gonna help us get, get started on a good solid ground. Barry's gonna introduce our presenters. We will have some amazing presentations that I'm so excited to hear. And then we'll have time for questions and then an open discussion and then do a little wrap up at the end. So that's the plan for today. I, I know, I just want to mention that, of course, there's always stuff that's emerging that you're like, ah, I want to talk about that. And uh, so if you're having that experience, which I understand, just make sure that you email that, it, the email's at the very end, and maybe we can put it in a chat box or something. But, you know, we do want to hear that, but we are still going to stay on track with, with all the material we've got. So... We want to capture it, just we can't fit everything. So next slide. A couple of reminders for how we make this thing work. Just remember that part of the reason that we're even bothering to have a meeting is so that we can really hear a diverse uh, spectrum of thoughts and feelings so that we can really come out of this with a, a broader understanding of the issues. So we, we anticipate we will have different ideas uh, we always want to treat each other with respect, even when we disagree. 
And um, one thing that's super helpful is if you can just stay on the topic and speak to the point is a nice way of saying, try to be succinct when you talk, try to not ramble so that everybody can be heard. And that also means you don't have to repeat your ideas or other people's ideas. This is all just time efficiency. Um, because we're now in Zoom world, uh, the, it's really helpful if everyone can stay in the room, like try to not do your emails and your texting while you're in the, in the space together so that we can really be present with each other. And um, in general, I know some people are more quick to jump in than others, but when we get to the discussion portion of our day, uh, I will be inviting people who haven't spoken yet to, to jump in, okay? So we can all be heard. So those are the guidelines. And uh, it's my honor to facilitate. And I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Gockley to give us uh, an overview of where we are. Stephen, take it away. Thank you, Holly. Um, I am Stephen Gockley. I'm a co-chair of the Incarceration Prevention and Reduction Task Force. And I'm one of the members of the planning team for this SAC process. Um, we realized uh, we should acknowledge the work that the SAC group has done already, you jumped into some really intense, really gnarly conversations with co-chairs of the task force's behavioral health committee and legal and justice systems committee to try to understand what work they were doing, what issues they had spotted and uh, what they anticipated future needs to be. Um, you all have really uh, been involved in that. You heard an incredibly detailed uh, uh, presentation on criminal legal data uh, last time. Um, and you're about to hear one that maybe even is more detailed than that, uh, because these are the pieces of, of what we're struggling with. And we thought in the midst of all that work you were doing and being swamped with, uh, we should loop back and, and, and try to focus on, on why we're here. So, just to distill it a little bit, um, the, our first responsibility is, is to inform ourselves uh, and to, to draw on subject matter, matter experts uh, on major needs in the criminal legal system. Um, also to work with the IPRTF, the task force, um, to uh, get a sense of priorities for both facilities and services uh, that would go with facilities to address needs and gaps that we could identify. Um, and uh, importantly, uh, the SAC group uh, is, is the guide for this process. Um, you'll see the end result uh, uh, below this, but we really need feedback and direction on the development of the needs assessment and the outcome of the needs assessment. Members of the public outside the SAC will have a chance to weigh in. These, these are sort of built into the DNA of the process, um, but uh, you all are, are uh, key factors in that guiding process. We'll end up with a result uh, that is a report presenting our recommendations. And ultimately the, the County Council will uh, develop a ballot initiative uh, to fund what we're calling the Justice Project, what the Council is calling the Justice Project, uh, for recommendations and other core programs uh, to reform the criminal legal system. Um, so those are the chunks of, of what our responsibility is for the task force. Marty, next slide, please. And, and the other grounding that, that I'll give as, as we just reorient ourselves are the guiding principles that the council gave us to work with. Um, we independently adopted uh, guidance from the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, um, which the task force utilizes uh, through its racial equity toolkit, which the county has become a member of and is, is working to figure out how exactly they want to implement, and which the SAC group has, has adopted as a, as a lodestar for, for its orientation in this work. So the guiding principles in the County Council resolution from 2019 reaffirmed again in 2021 are we want a shared public safety facility that integrates behavioral health services. Uh, we want to link stewardship of funds, public safety concerns, 
and the availability of appropriate behavioral health services. We want all those to fit together. Um, we, want to, uh, we want to look to task force annual reports that have provided specific recommendations to the county. Um, we wanna make sure funding is committed to community-based preventive services, upstream work, as well as post-release support um, after the fact work to prevent a cycling uh, into the jail system. Um, we wanna continue to look, look uh, at behavioral health facilities and services as alternatives to the jail. Next slide, Marty. Uh, council directed us to uh, draw on data uh, and provide data to de decision makers and the public um, and to develop data collection uh, in conjunction with efforts by the index committee of the task force. We wanna recommend size for the jail facilities that take into account diversion programs and justice policies that draw people into those facilities. We want a jail location that works best for all partners, uh, looking again at a downtown Bellingham location as opposed to alternatives that might be uh, worthy of consideration. We want to take into account the fact that the Iron Gate minimum security facility that we have up and running um, is a valuable part of the continuum of justice services. We want to make sure that construction op operating costs are apportioned separately among jail users, that is uh, county, cities, uh, and uh, tribal partners, based on actual uses. Uh, or estimates of future use. Last slide, Marty. Uh, we wanna continue to reduce the current use of bail and pro develop probation procedures that can affect the jail population. We intend, the council has directed us to uh, intend to hire a behavioral health and criminal justice planner to evaluate additional aspects of the justice system and needs that we might have going forward. This is a long range of, uh, capital plan, at least in part. Uh, we wanna have a funding proposal on the ballot that will fund the improvements we recommend. Um, and lastly, we wanna do all of this uh, through a commitment to a transparent planning process with opportunities for community input. You are part of, part of that community input. Um, we'll go beyond the, the SAC membership um, and look for even more community input. I think that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen. That was great. Hey, I'm gonna step in here for a minute with a logistics issue. So everybody, we need you to name yourselves because we that's how we do the roll call for the meeting. So if you haven't yet figured it out, here's what you do. You, you see how we've got, if you're just listed as a SAC member, you wanna hover your cursor over where it says SAC member, there's a little blue box with three dots and you put your cursor up there and you click it. And then it will say like rename and then you just type in your name. If you can't do that, then I'd like you to raise your hand if you can figure that out or just speak up so we can at least get, uh, so, so that Kathy can get your name for the, for the roll call. So give, I'll, I'll give you a minute. Um, to figure that out, and then I'll ask you if you have not yet figured it out. Oh, getting there. Good job, everybody. Yeah, I think we got it. Just one more person, it looks like. I'm going to let you keep messing with it, um, but we're pretty close. Okay, Barry, go ahead. Thanks, Holly. Okay, we're going to move into our presentation. I just wanted to recognize our presenters today. Uh, we have Mike Parker, who's the manager of Housing and Healthcare Integration for the Opportunity Council. We have Jackie Mitchell. She's a Behavioral Health Program Specialist with the Whatcom County Health Department. We have Perry Mowry. He's Behavioral Health and Special Projects Supervisor for the Whatcom County Health Department. And we have Dean White. He's a Special Projects Manager for the Whatcom County Health Department. So I'd like to turn it over now to those folks and they will lead us through uh, the work they've been doing for the past few months. 
Barry, thank you for the introduction. It's nice to see all of you here today. The only piece that I would add about my identity is I'm a social worker. So um, you know, justice project stuff is near and dear to my heart. Um, I serve currently as the co-chair with council member Dan Hamill for the behavioral health subcommittee. And it's nice to see you all again. Just a quick remark too on the process that uh, created this presentation today. Those folks that uh, Barry mentioned at the health department are some just amazingly bright and compassionate folks. I've been honored to spend time with them and I think you're gonna see a pretty good product. So without any further ado, I wanna jump in um, to this. And I, it, Holly, I think if I'm getting it correctly, they'll be able to table questions and have them towards the end. Uh, but hopefully my part is, is pretty clear. So I'm just gonna go over real quick goals of the, of the presentation today um, and kind of why we're all here, right? So obviously we're, we're here to focus on, on some particular folks. We know that lots of people are in and out of the jail, right? Um, but we're really here to focus today on those with pretty severe mental health and substance use disorders. And you'll see the SIM, which I think you've all been sent, but the sequential intercept model was designed for that. So that's my piece, talk a little bit about that. So just remembering our focus, right? We're gonna focus on that aspect. We're gonna to try to understand the SIM. It's both kind of wonky, but it's also a really cool tool. And communities of diverse stakeholders across the country have been able to come together using this tool to really help identify those key things, the first steps that we wanna to do to improve our system so that we're treating people um, and getting the treatment and recovery they need and not jailing the people that don't need to be there. We're here to learn. We're gonna to try to learn how uh, the SIM has been used to identify gaps and how the sequential intercept um, can be useful in us to, to think about how somebody might get caught up into a criminal legal system. And we're gonna begin, and I would argue maybe even continue, right? Because I think some of you are already providing feedback, but the process of prioritizing those programs and services that are gonna be most beneficial, that have been maybe even proven to reduce the jail census. Those are gonna be critical. Next slide, please. So what is the sequential intercept model? Again, I called it kind of a wonky thing, but I like wonky dorky things, but I mean, this, it, it really is pretty amazing. Um, so the, uh, the sequential intercept model, um, I can get to my notes. I'm going to get these names right because we want to give them some credit. So in the early 2000s, um, physicians that were looking at their patients, right, moving through this system, but uh, Dr. Mark Manetz, Patricia Griffin, along with Harry Stedman of Policy Research Associates created the SIM. Um, they were obviously trying to look at something in a slightly more systematic way. Why do we keep finding people in our jails with such severe mental illness, right? And how might we do something different? Well, we needed a tool to figure that out. The SIM is a, is a conceptual model. Um, again, I mentioned that communities across the United States have used this model to kind of see how the flow happens. So you can almost like visually see the flow. Um, so we're gonna try and get some sense of those, of those spots. I already mentioned it's a useful tool and hopefully it's gonna be a useful tool for our community. You know, the RPRTF has been using this in the past um, and we're excited about this update. But essentially the, the reason for doing all this assessment is so that we winnow down the list of interventions and we get ones that are gonna be helpful for our community. Next slide. What the SIM is not. Well, it's, it's not our laundry list. It, it's, it's not for absolutely everything. As I mentioned with the first slide of focus, we're really looking at those folks with behavioral health challenges. Um, and so that's essentially what the SIM was created for is to track um, not only the movement through a criminal legal system, but those intercepts or think of them as like a point of intervention where a, a helpful product or a program or a helpful person can help divert that. So there are certainly one of the examples that, um, that was told to me is, well, why don't we include Head Start? Well, Head Start is a wonderful program, but it's not targeted towards those with behavioral health challenges. So it does help us kind of focus. And, um, and there are different places, by the way, for those ideas, which prevention ideas are really important. Next slide. So I mentioned um, my role, right? So I'm in the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force, um, and that body um, adopted the SIM as a way to um, 
be a little more systematic about all the different ideas that people were cropping up for, whether you call it criminal justice reform or enhancement or augmentation, any of those things would fit. We needed a framework, a rubric to help us kind of guide that. There's a lot of information to go through. There were a lot of gaps to look at. Um, so uh, you'll see here, there's a, a snapshot of a report that is available, I think uh, still on the website. Um, a county's website if anybody wanted to look into that. So we have already been using this tool um, so far uh, with some success. And I think one of your presenters may talk about how dynamic this process is. This is not a staid or static mapping exercise. It's really ongoing. So we started this back then and this iteration and this update that you all will be seeing is the largest um, the largest update uh, since the since the we first did this in 2018 and 19. And next one. So I believe, and Holly and Marty, everybody's re received this right in, in advance of today's meeting, so at least have seen it. So what do all those columns mean? I'll try and give you a little plain speak about what the columns are. Um, originally, the SAM, just so you know, started out with intercepts one through five. One of the critiques from communities that used it and why they added intercept zero, it's like we need to talk prevention work, we need to talk upstream, how does that happen if we're only starting at one. So just a little note on the history of the SIM, intercept zero was a welcome addition, the task force adopted the addition when the, when the creators of the SIM uh, rolled that out, and we think it's really important. So think things community based programs. Um, interventions and things to keep people out of even seeing their first law enforcement officer happen in intercept zero. Intercept one we think of as law enforcement, so some infraction may happen, there's some interaction, frequently seen as a spot for diversion to uh, lead programs and things like that are frequently seen at the spot of intercept one. Again, this is another, uh, uh, another uh, spot in the process where we can intervene. Um, there's a possibility that, that person may not go to jail if we can find a better, a different alternative for them. Intercept two, um, initial detention and, and court hearings. Obviously, once that person has seen law enforcement and infraction has been done, there's a whole host of, of uh, processes that happen in there. The SIM helps us break down some of those pre-trial um, processes to help us look at that process and see where we might make tweaks. Intercept three, you'll see, is actually in jails and courts. So the person is at this point in custody and or awaiting trial or adjudication in some way. Intercept four being re-entry, the person has served their time and is preparing to re-enter into the community. A lot of discharge planning and a lot of appropriate housing and supports are needed so that we don't see recidivism. So when you think about recidivism, really in intercept four, well, some would argue through the whole process, we're, we're trying to avoid that. But intercept four is a big spot for that. And then the last one, intercept five, post-incarceration community supports. Now, obviously, if people are, if the same, um, if the same conditions are there for that person that there were when they um, got into trouble with law enforcement, then we often see the exact same issue. So we have to make um, a, a services available to folks in the way that they need them and the style that they need them and in an ongoing nature so that we really prevent that cycle and hopefully um, we don't go back to intercept one. So hopefully that brief uh, coverage gives you a little sense of those of those different columns. The last piece just to inform you all is the, the tier. So you probably saw that in your SIM. Um, and tier A would be things that we have. You could look at that as an asset map. That's great. Those things are wonderful. Those are things your community already has. Some of those things, by the way, even though I've looked at it, were new to me. So it's always good to refresh yourself and see what is our community actually doing already. Tier B would be something that our community has, but we've identified it. The people that run it have identified it. Our community members have told us it's not sufficient. Maybe it's not enough. There's not enough slots. There's not enough staff. So it's one that we know we've adopted the practice, but we're not doing it to its full extent for whatever reason. Often it's funding or bandwidth or, or tend to be uh, resource shortages, the type of resources. The last is, is, is the wish list as I like to think about it. It's tier C. These are things that are identified by our community, by stakeholders. And I mentioned a broad bunch of stakeholders that think this is a really good idea for our community. That's why it's on here, but we don't have it yet. So one of the things that we'll wanna do is figure out during this process, what are those key things that we need to possibly lift up um, to move us uh, further along um, this, this process. With that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's my last slide. Oh, no, I got one more. Sorry, 
skipping that one. I mentioned before why we don't put Head Start, why you won't see Head Start in Intercept Zero. My organization run Head Start. I'm a firm believer in um, preventative activities. But also, if we're, if we're not focused, we, we find that we're not as effective. And so when we were going through this, we looked at some of the things around the SIM and we realized, you know, these aren't all programs. Some of these things are ideas or policy or advocacy, or we want a law changed, or we want to tell Olympia this. Well, that place needs someplace to live. And so as part of the SIM update process that's been happening right now, what we did is we've decided we want to capture that. We want to honor that. And we think they're really important, but they don't fit neatly into the little box of a program. So kind of two core issues, policy issues, as we know, there's lots of legal changes affecting who can be in our jail, who can't, and, and the ability of law enforcement to be effective, right? Those are policy issues. The other thing that we've seen are process ideas, like, you know, if we just did this, if we communicated differently. So again, we want spots to be able to hold all that information. Next. And with this, I believe this is, we pass off to Ms. Jackie Mitchell, if I'm not correct. Thank you, Mike. Great, great job, by the way. So this is, um, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, tier A, which is consists of, of the sequential intercept model, which consists of behavioral health programs and services, uh, which are already in place in the community and which intersect uh, with the criminal legal system. Now we've got a couple that are under development. Um, such as alternative response and co-responder programs, um, but they're imminent any day now. And then um, what's I think interesting here is that a lot of these programs are either best practice, evidence-based or innovative. In other words, they were, um, they were created and designed specifically with our community in mind. <clears throat> and um, they all have uh, fantastic outcomes either here or have shown fantastic outcomes in other communities, um, but that would be a, a presentation of a much longer length than I think we have today. And I just wanted to add that um, that so many of these, especially recent programs and, and services wouldn't be wouldn't have been possible without the help of folks like uh, um, Council Member Dan Hamill, Under Sheriff Doug Chadwick, um, former Chief of Police um, Flo Simon, as well as a whole host of uh, first responders in the system that um, partnered with us to try and develop these programs and everybody working towards the same goal. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows um, the incidents from a st statewide of uh, mental health, substance use disorder and co-occurring disorder need in jails. This report was finalized in 2016 and it contained 2013 booking data from jails all over the state. Um, and then it compared that jail data with Medicaid services uh, over a period of time. Um, you can see that the incidence for each of those needs was quite high. And we believe that even with uh, how high these numbers are that they uh, still do not reflect uh, the full need uh, of people having mental health needs or substance use disorder needs and especially co-occurring disorder needs in the jail. Um, but I do think that this slide confirms what jail staff have been saying, which is that there's an incredibly high acuity level that has evolved over the last few years. And we think that's related to the fact that the state has been shutting down programs, behavioral health programs that they run and then not resourcing communities enough to be able to take those programs on themselves. So next slide, please. And then in our own jail, the Whatcom County Jail, um, you see some 22 um, data, which also shows an incredibly high, in this case, a in high incidence of people with serious mental illness and uh, a high incidence of the likelihood of people with substance use disorder. And, and so this trend just continues to the current day where uh, a number of people uh, require on an average, on a daily basis, require psychotropic medications, particularly antipsychotics and mood stabilizers, which are associated with people with serious mental illnesses. And then that number, that last number, 12 people waiting for competency restoration is fluctuates up and down. Um, the number of days is always uh, quite lengthy. The average length of, of the wait period right now is 55 days. And this is uh, th these are people waiting 
uh, to be restored to competency. In other words, they're uh, hopefully going to be able to aid in their own defense uh, in a court proceeding. Um, next slide. And so um, this kind of highlights, I think, where the health department went with seeing all the gaps in the service system and noticing that there really wasn't anybody out in the community that could both provide some of these programs and sort of centralize, centralize it under one roof, the coordination under one roof. And so in a rather innovative move, the health department uh, decided to take under its wing and develop uh, the, the programs Grace and LEAD and um, Alternative Response and Co-Response under its wing and develop a new division called the Response System Division. That division has a really grand and I think uh, far-reaching vision uh, to ensure that everyone in the system uh, can access services when they need them. And that includes people, especially people in the criminal legal system. And that any door, they, a person could access through any door, any provider's door and get services. And even if it was the wrong door, they could still get access by maybe a, a super warm handoff to a community provider that, that did provide the services. And then all of this is only possible through um, a vast system of coordination of services, uh, which I think the response systems division is in a perfect uh, a perfect situation to be able to provide. Um, and and that, that means coordinating with our community partners uh, through the use of shared and transparent data, um, uh, which, which is what makes all of this possible. And hopefully over time, we can build a system that will um, uh, be able to fill most of the gaps in the in the current behavioral health system. Next slide. I think that's Perry. Okay. I think you're correct, Ms. Mitchell. <laughs> Good afternoon, folks. Uh, Perry Mowry, uh, Response Systems Division Supervisor. Um, I wanted to come back and talk just a little bit about the uh, behavioral health gap analysis team. Um, as we start with this, uh, the team uh, was made up of, we fondly refer to the team as BEGAT, the behavioral health gap analysis team. Um, listed here, 13 subject matter experts with uh, experience and knowledge of behavioral health programs, uh, prevention intervention activities, housing, homeless programs, uh, shelter services, and other existing programs in the community. Um, the BEGAT includes representatives from varying programs and specialties within the health department, uh, also emergency medical services, and uh, the housing and healthcare integration um, as well. So just wanted to uh, outline the folks that were involved in this. Obviously, you're meeting four of them. Uh, today and in, in speaking, but um, there were uh, a, a number of additional folks that helped with this process and brought uh, knowledge to the table. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so what the BEGAT did was we met uh, weekly for roughly a three month period of time uh, to review, discuss, seek input, and uh, reach consensus on updates to the SIM and the SIM addendum as well. We discussed the sequential intercept model design and, and purpose uh, uh, as, as well as the parameters uh, that Mike Parker had mentioned uh, that the team would use in considering updates and what did fit on the sequential intercept model and maybe what uh, was more appropriately placed on the uh, addendum. Um, we also reflected on the importance of racial equity and uh, the complex issues that exist, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that exist in the jail and community related to the programs and services that we were discussing. Uh, we started our work with the original sequential intercept model, as again, Mr. Parker had uh, made reference, that was developed by the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force in 2019-2020. Uh, so we had a framework to work from, which was 
uh, which was very helpful. And we actually found it unnecessary to remove anything uh, that was already listed on uh, the sequential intercept model from 2019, 2020, although we did have changes in programs that we'll, uh, we'll talk some about. So they ended up in different tiers uh, than they had originally been placed. Um, we remained mindful that our work was an initial step in identifying the existing programs. We could bring the knowledge that we had uh, and take a look at the gaps that we were able to identify uh, in terms of services for individuals at risk of or already involved in the criminal legal system. So those were uh, some of the steps that we took. Um, in the next slide, I talk a bit about uh, the criteria that we established as a group. Um, and that is <clears throat> that the team <clears throat> uh, looked at a primary target population of youth and adults with mental and substance use disorders who were at risk of or who have already become involved with the criminal legal system. We knew, as Ms. Mitchell had made reference, that uh, research reflected that a significant number of individuals in the jail suffer from an array of untreated mental and substance use disorders and we're oriented towards programming in that regard. Um, we also uh, oriented towards programs and services designed to prevent involvement in the criminal legal system. As uh, again, Mr. Parker made reference with uh, Intercept Zero, um, that is uh, uh, upstream work and intervention prevention work that uh, uh, an individual can receive services that will uh, reduce the likelihood of them being involved in the, um, the legal system at all. Uh, we look closely at programs and services that support individuals uh, diverting from or successfully exiting from the criminal legal system, which includes really the programs from intercepts one through intercepts five, uh, potentially, uh, depending on the, uh, the outcomes of those individual intercept points. Um, we also focused on programs and services that support individuals who may not have a behavioral health issue, but are struggling with housing, education, employment, uh, and or relationship challenges, for example, that we uh, could ensure that services were available to them uh, to, to work through those processes and avoid returning to or becoming further involved in the uh, criminal legal system. <clears throat> Next slide. So um, there was some pretty involved processes if you uh, can follow sort of the descriptions that I am uh, going through here. I don't know that we necessarily did it in this uh, specific of the steps, but generally as I described uh, the activities that we did, we started out, we moved items from tier A, that is programs in place across all of the intercepts. Um, and we moved those into uh, tier B, programs in place but lacking resources, or possibly Tier C, programs recommended but currently not existing, if successful service programs uh, had been lost over the past two years. We added services to Tier A or, or B if they uh, lacked full resources for new or partially funded programs um, that had started since the last SIM update. Um, we also recommended services and programs to Tier C that don't currently exist, but based on experience and demand for services from the different team members uh, that we felt were important resources to uh, serve the identified population uh, we were oriented towards. Um, also, uh, there was a, a bit of discussion when the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force originally developed the SIM back in 2019, 2020, they had created appendixes um, uh, that were actually referenced on the SIM. You can find it in some of the documents that we've included here. Um, we discussed the two appendixes that actually listed a number of services and programs and came to the conclusion as the behavioral health gap analysis team that we wanted to move those items and actually place them on the SIM itself to simplify the outline and to reduce the number of documents that were necessary to review uh, in order to, uh, to get the picture of uh, what we were looking at. Next slide, please. To gather additional input, uh, the team sent out a copy of the draft SIM and survey requesting review and suggestions from a number of different groups in the community, and those groups are listed here. I won't uh, read them again, um, but I 
felt great about the fact that we were reaching out to an initial uh, a group of individuals as a process of getting the input and much of the input actually uh, very much solidified some of the discussions uh, that we had already had. We received feedback from uh, 21 uh, different entities uh, as a result of that survey, and we reviewed the feedback and suggestions as a team for placement on the SIM or, uh, in some situations, the addendum, you know, again. Uh, next slide, please. We recognize that the sequential intercept model is a living document, as we as we talked about before, and that the work the BEGAT has done uh, is an initial step in the SIM update, and significant changes occurred over the past two years uh, since the task force uh, work in 2019 and 2020. Um, further review and updates are needed by the stakeholder uh, advisory committee, uh, the task force, and certainly other uh, uh, entities within the community. Um, so we're really recognizing this as a living document, um, not something that stops and not something that is only uh, informed by a particular group. As we've seen over even the last two years, some pretty extraordinary things happening, obviously, in our community and world. Um, but uh, significant changes happen with programming as well. Some exciting programs to be able to add to um, uh, tier A and, and to some of the intercepts. Uh, we certainly expect that additional updates and input in the future will continue to be important. Uh, next slide. So at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to stop and, and before we proceed forward and, and talk uh, some about how we identified the system gaps as a team, uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone understands the SIM as a tool um, and what the purpose of the SIM was and also uh, um, how that's used to identify gaps. Um, we wanna make sure that everybody understands uh, that and also the steps that the behavioral health gap analysis team has taken um, to update the SIM um, at this point. Uh, and uh, then we'll go ahead and move into uh, uh, Dean White talking about the actual uh, steps and processes and um, gaps that we identified as a team and uh, made recommendations to. So questions about um, the SIM as a tool uh, that we might be able to respond to or uh, about the steps so far described by the behavioral health gap analysis team. Great. Thank you, Perry. That was marvelous. Uh, folks, if you can see at the bottom of your screen, you have that raise hand button. So I'll call on you as I, I see them. A tool. Yeah, you're up. And folks, if you can put your camera on, that's that's really helpful as well. A tool. Go ahead. Well, yeah. Of course, I'm one of those people who is not shy about raising their hand and speaking. Nice. I'll try to be brief, though. Um, my uh, question is, the sequential intercept model from my reviewing also is, seems like a really useful tool. However, one of the things I want to clarify is to what degree the items on that list are always sequential. I mean, um, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this, but just for the, for, from a perspective of my understanding, how much do the people that have been working with us now in this community for the last couple of years See this as actually uh, completely sequential and or not necessarily. Yeah, great question. Uh, who'd like to feel that one? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I'll take a stab at it. By the way, that was a really thoughtful question. Um, you know, I think you've hit at part of what we hope that it does is that we hope that we've designed a program that intervenes that may forestall movement and so they're not when we say sequential they don't have to be and we're really hoping that one of those steps along the way intervenes or derails that um, the other thing that we've noticed and uh, and to a tool's point you may see a program in more than one intercept and part of the reason for that is exactly to his point, like that is so spot on that we may find that we need interventions at multiple places because it is not always so clean cut going one, two, three, four, and five. There, there can be some change in that. Hopefully that's somewhat helpful. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I'll just elaborate on Mike's response, which I thought was, uh, was a great one with an example. Um, 
in intercept three, one of the interventions would be drug court, which diverts people into, into a treatment program rather than incarceration. Um, when the task force started talking to the drug court team, they found out one of the challenges was where people could be housed while they were not being incarcerated. If they were back in their old environment, which was living in drug houses and mixing with, uh, with other drug users, they were less likely to succeed in the drug court program and more likely to be reincarcerated. Um, so partly with, with partners, we went about setting up the, uh, the drug court housing that's now open and functioning on Meridian Street in the old social detox building. Well, that's also intercept five, a continuing community support because when people succeed in a drug court program, they, they still need a stable, supportive community that can keep them uh, from reoffending, uh, reabusing. Um, so that's an example of something you could place in a couple of different intercept models because at various points in time, it serves different functions. Great, thank you. All right, other questions people have about the SIM and what it is and the work that's been done so far to update it. Yeah, Michael. So this is provoking some, some thoughts. It's really good. Um, if it's not a literal sequence, what are we describing? Um, it, I'm trying to figure out if, they, if we could if think about it in another way in terms of uh, uh, the severity of the problem or how, how great the uh, harm or hurt is and how far along towards the healing. When I looked at it, I kind of saw the middle ones as a traditional, you know, capture, prosecute, hold accountable. And as you kind of went outward, they kind of got softer and more humane. Right, things you do at the far end to just simply prevent problems and, 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 and nurture people and give them skills, and at the far end, you're kind of doing the same thing again, you know, afterwards. So, if it isn't really sequential, what is it? And I kind of saw this inside out kind of you know, bi directional spectrum. I, I don't have a good way of describing it, but I, again, I to tool, thank you for saying what you said. I don't know if sequence is the best way to describe it. I think it's really good to divide it in these six categories because they do seem quite different and they do take place in, in different places. Uh, it's meaningful, but I'm just trying to think about how I want to understand uh, the relationship among the six. Yeah, and is sequential really the, the most descriptive word? Yeah, I see, Dean, you've got, you have a response to that? Yeah, I just would say that um, I think what all of these observations point to is that in real life, the experience of individuals isn't linear when it comes to uh, getting caught up in the criminal legal system. Um, and it's really just a way of helping to organize our thinking and our interventions around points uh, at which one might uh, uh, prevent or forestall future involvement in the criminal legal system. So I, you know, I, I think uh, it's probably best not to um, take too seriously this linear kind of a model other than just to help us organize the various kinds of interventions that we can make. Mm, thank you. Dan, did you have a response to that same question before? Yeah, I do. Um, so, so we didn't name this thing. This thing was developed in the early 2000s by uh, Dr. Munitz, uh, Dr. Griffin, and uh, Stedman of the Policy Research uh, Associates. Uh, I, I look at it as a way, we adopted this tool so we could um, use it kind of to what Dean's point was, a way of organizing the programs uh, and services that we have in the, in the community. So Michael, I would look at it as a way to um, understand where particular um, interventions and intercepts can be used as a, um, a ladder up out of the system or an off ramp out, depending on what analogy you want to use. But it's just a way to kind of organize those things along along the way. And I, I can't remember who said it's not linear, if that was um, Dean or not, but it, that's absolutely true. Everyone's experience is different. 
but um, going through the court system or going through the criminal justice system, if that, whether or not that includes jail, um, that's just a way for us to look at it. Great, thanks. Okay, so understanding that the, the term doesn't exactly describe what we're looking at, and it's actually much, um, a lot of different points within that in which people are interfacing with the system. Uh, Burrell, I see your hand up, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I had a question about one of the last things that, that you said, Perry, about just incorporating input and how to get more voices beyond the organizations that have already given input to the SIM. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that. Like, how, how, like how are you doing that? How, how is more input from the community being uh, solicited? And I'd also like to just name that I would love at some point for this group to have a longer discussion about that piece in not just around the SIM model, but really about this entire project. Thanks. So great question, uh, Burrell. And uh, we hope that you and the other uh, stakeholder advisory committee members will be directly involved um, in this work group and input. And so that uh, being one group uh, that we would certainly uh, uh, engage and uh, gather additional information from through surveys. I know that uh, Barry had mentioned that we have a work group that is scheduled uh, at this point. So in a number of different formats, being able to uh, gather additional information. We were also aware of the fact that, you know, we reached out to a, a, a set of groups of individuals that were in the community, but by no means have we exhausted uh, the input. And we did find that Surveys was a fairly convenient way to do that. Uh, sending out the SIM, understanding the SIM was a little, you know, it can be a little challenging. Uh, and then also understanding that the uh, sequential intercept model is not really a listing of all programs that occur within the community, but that it's targeted towards individuals that are uh, involved in the criminal legal system and, and also uh, typically struggling with mental and or substance use disorders. Um, so really excited about getting that input, uh, continuing to get that input, and I, I suspect the thought process that even that activity will continue in uh, future updates as well. Uh, and uh, so that would be my response to that, bro. Great question. Yeah, I should jump in here too and, and take this opportunity to mention that after this meeting, we're going to send you all out a survey for any other thoughts that you have that you didn't get a chance to voice during this discussion today or that came to you, you know, late in the night. And also there will be a link to the SIM where you can give feedback on the SIM. That's the same exact link that they used to get feedback earlier, the survey that, that Perry was just describing. So Brell and others who would like to get into the weeds on that, you wanna click that link and just jump right in, okay? Oh, you fun. Okay, Daniel. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one thing the sim does not do is it doesn't consider, in my opinion, um, the, the overlays of certain um, uh, externalities like the Blake decision and its influence on simple possession, um, Martin B. Boise, which um, is not a criminal item, but it would affect a person's um, housing or sh shelter, sorry, um, which might lead to um, committing a, um, a, a property crime or, or something like that. And uh, Long, v, Long V Seattle, which um, affects uh, people in living in, in RVs. Um, so there's a, there's a number of different, um, and those I just use those uh, as examples, Blake in particular, I think that's really the one, um, or the uh, raft of laws that came through a state legislature in 2021 that um, affected um, pl police uh, basically. So I, I think that, SIM doesn't cover those things, so I but I think that we need to think about how those things impact um, various um, things on the SIM and the other work that we're that we're doing. So thanks. Right. Thanks. Okay, so Mike, I'm going to ask you to respond, and then we're going to have to shift gears again. There's going to be a survey into the mix. Okay, Mike, go ahead. I'll be super brief. Um, 
bro, you brought up an, an amazingly good point, and it's really key. Who's at the table and who's giving feedback, right? If you're reforming something, you got to make sure folks are there. I would also just mention, we didn't put on the slide, but the, the um, input from listening sessions that were done uh, by executives to do and others was was also considered there were ideas that came out of that was in there. We should have put that on the slide because actually um, Gail is, was on our group kind of brought some of that, which was a different type of, of input and extremely valuable, way more needs based, right? Um, and less about here's a program to stick in, but it was extremely powerful. Um, and that's the other piece I would have. Thank you. Great. Okay, I'm going to need to move on. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to stop video because I'm having a little internet issue. Okay, we're going to pull the PowerPoint up. Again, if you have comments, go ahead and put them. Uh, there will be a survey after after our meeting, and we're going to move. keep moving. Okay, and um, so first of all, uh, I'm Dean White, and um, have worked in this group uh, for the last uh, several weeks, as Perry had mentioned. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, I believe all of you have received in your packet or prior to the meeting, the actual uh, updated behavioral health um, um, gap analysis update of the sequential intercept model. And so we're not gonna be going through slides that look at that very detailed and fine print kind of document, but we're gonna be providing some slides that uh, summarize some of our uh, conclusions, uh, at least initially. Um, and as has been described, the notion is that using the SIM for this purpose is really a way to focus our attention on uh, the particular target population of folks who are at risk for becoming involved in the criminal legal system or who already are. Uh, and in particular, we've been focusing on um, Tier B, uh, which was described, as you recall, those existing services and programs that don't have sufficient capacity or resources, as well as tier C, which is um, programs or services that don't exist in this community, but that we um, or others who've had input uh, believe would be of value. Um, and, and so we've done that kind of work. Uh, next slide. So the subject matter experts, um, that made up the behavioral health gap analysis team have used the SIM as I just described. We, we reviewed each item in tiers B and C, those for which we have shortages or they don't exist, and then we've ranked them on a one, two, or three basis, one being the highest priority. In terms of gaps, we felt were most important to address and have the most impact on reducing the jail census. Now that's not to discount the importance of the other services which have other helpful outcomes, but we're trying to focus our attention in on now on the highest priority interventions or changes that uh, we might propose. And it's not a done deal as uh, has been indicated where uh, there's going to be continued participation and in input and solicitation of, of ideas as this process goes on. In the next several slides, we're gonna focus though on items that we ranked uh, in our group as of the first or highest priority. Uh, and I'm gonna walk you through those and in, in each of uh, uh, four categories. And then Holly's gonna lead a Q and A and a discussion of what we've come up with uh, after you've seen those initially. Next slide. So we've grouped the service gaps that we've ranked as having the highest priority into these four general categories by type of service. Uh, and as you can see, and, and as has been, uh, the point's been made, um, these service groups often impact more than one intercept point in the SIM model. Um, Community-based uh, programs, for example, can prevent uh, in an upstream way, but they can also uh, at uh, intercept point five, uh, avoid uh, a return to involvement in the criminal justice system. And again, I'll, we'll walk through those and then we'll have some discussion about them. Next slide. So the first category is uh, community-based services. And here are the, uh, the four that we felt had the, the, the gaps that were of the highest priority to attend to. There is a need to 
allow people to access mental health and substance use disorder assessments in a much more timely way, uh, sort of on demand without waiting. So it's been a principle of or aspiration of the behavioral health system for a number of years and kind of waxes and wanes. Right now it's waned substantially with the, man, uh, the workforce issues. Um, but not having access to assessment at the point that a person understands their need for intervention is a huge problem. Uh, there is a uh, really a shortage, not so much a lack, I guess I would say, but a shortage of community substance use disorder treatment. Uh, there is less capacity for that kind of service than there is a need. But we need an increased capacity in a program known as the Program for Assertive Community Treatment, or PACT, uh, for those folks who have severe and persistent mental illness, uh, and often with a co-occurring uh, substance use disorder. And finally, uh, the response time to, uh, to requests from law enforcement by the uh, designated crisis responders, uh, it needs to be improved on. And it's, a, it's a capacity issue. Uh, this is a request when law enforcement um, in, uh, believes there is a potential for a person to be detainable under the uh, uh, Involuntary Treatment Act uh, detention criteria. But if there's not a quick response uh, by the uh, DCR to that request, um, often it results in, in an arrest and incarceration because of that um, insufficient response time. Next slide. Jail-based services. Those services that are offered or could be offered uh, actually in the jail setting. There are an insufficient number of intensive case managers for the jail. Uh, these are folks uh, who are able to provide uh, meaningful support and treatment while people are incarcerated and collaborate with those efforts for post-release service planning. I think as you've heard reference to in Jackie's material, there's a uh, lack of access to timely competency restoration. Um, 55 uh, days on average is unconscionable, and people simply sit in jail waiting to have the kinds of services that would restore their competency to be able to participate meaningfully in their own, in their own defense. Uh, there's a need for um, increased access to mental health and substance use disorder assessments, again, in a timely way while uh, persons are in jail so that their needs become identified and uh, uh, treatment then can be arranged or pursued. And finally, um, there is a need uh, for which really there is as yet no consensus on a, uh, an effective evidence-based treatment, but a need for treatment to address methamphetamine dependency. And uh, by the way, if any of you had spent time studying the, uh, the Intercept do uh, document, the model, uh, prior to the meeting, you would have also noticed that there was a uh, mention that there was a shortage or a need for medicated medication assisted treatment and for medication for opioid use disorder treatment uh, in the jail. Um, we learned just uh, in the last uh, few days that uh, a program has now been instituted in the jail um, with a recent grant that is serving up to 100 inmates uh, who are now receiving uh, medication-assisted treatment uh, for their opioid use disorders in the jail. So that didn't get on this. It got removed from this list. Uh, there will be issues of sustainability down the road you know, in terms of this program continuing. But that, that's just an indication of how dynamic this process is of identifying programs and shortages and, and needs that we might have. Next slide. With respect to re-entry uh, from uh, incarceration back into the community, um, it's been identified that we don't have sufficient staff to aid in that process. That occurs both while the person is still incarcerated and then for a period of time after they're uh, released from, uh, from jail. And there's just not a sufficient capacity of staff to do that work. And then of course, continued challenge. We thought we'd had it solved uh, uh, with respect to getting Medicaid uh, coverage reinstated at the point of uh, 
uh, release from jail, but it continues to be an issue uh, just in terms of delaying the, the reinstatement of benefits, which then creates a gap in transition from jail to community-based services that could uh, help folks avoid reincarceration, re uh, reinvolvement with a criminal legal system. Next slide. And again, uh, this is called post-incarceration, but it really does have to do with both intercepts five and intercept zero. Uh, there is just a lack of sufficient permanent supportive housing, which is by, by which we mean uh, housing where there is 24 seven staffing and on-site clinical support uh, for people who have the, the behavioral health challenges that have gotten them uh, involved in the criminal legal system in the first place. It's not just a roof over the uh, folks' heads, but support that recognizes their need for assistance uh, as they read, as they transition back into the community. And particularly for those uh, who are involved in therapeutic court, um, a need for some housing dedicated specifically to, to their needs while they're uh, going through that process of an alternative, uh, an alternative process to uh, prosecution. And again, related to methamphetamine dependence, um, for folks in the community, there is just a critical need for residential treatment for that particular substance use disorder, uh, for which we're still struggling to discover uh, the appropriate kind of evidence-based treatment. Next slide. So, uh, Holly, I think I'm going to hand it to you now to facilitate a discussion of um, those items that have been presented in the last several slides. Excellent. Thank you, Dean. All right, folks. Um, I just need to warn you that my I'm at the meeting in the library and the internet's being a little funky. So if I if you lose me, uh, Barry's going to step in. But otherwise, hopefully this will all go brilliantly. So these are the questions we want to ask of everybody. We're going to go through each of those four components that Dean just described. And we're going to have time for a discussion of do these match your sense of what the needs and gaps are and what the priorities are? And are there other high priority needs and gaps that you think are important to consider? So we're really gonna try and think of it like a piece at a time. And um, Kathy, is it easy to scroll back up to, yeah, never mind. Remember there were four, there was a little cross and there's four areas. We're gonna go through each one. At it. And so we'll take like, you know, about 10 minutes per. And again, it would be great if everybody jumped in. You don't, Remember, you don't have to, I don't know, you don't have to have all the answers or, or, you know, have the perfect question. Just try and be succinct and on point. So here are the four that we're going to look at, and we're going to start with community-based. So this, these are the components that people are thinking about so far. So what are your thoughts about the needs and gaps? Do they match your sense of what the priorities are? And are there other high priority needs and gaps that you think are missing that are important to consider? So the floor is open. What do you all think? Yeah, Scott, go ahead. I, I guess I'm in some of these meetings, I hear about the first point, uh, need to increase access to mental health and substance use disorder. Um, but it, it, sometimes I hear, even if you have the people, they're not willing to accept the treatment. I, I guess I'd like, discussion on how do we get them in if they won't accept it and what percent don't accept it or does anybody have a clue on that to help us guide the discussion great excellent so the way we'll do this is um if you have a response to that i'm gonna uh let's see i'm gonna guess it was jackie who might have a response to that question just from the timing of you popping up your hand did i guess right Right, yeah. Um, so this is the anecdotal, of course, but um, in the jail behavioral health program, what we notice is about 30% of the people refuse the services. And uh, so we were kind of taking that into account. And when we do the next steps of trying to kind of determine how many people we actually could serve. Um, but it's a really good question because um, I'm not sure at other points along uh, the service continuum, how many people might refuse services, but certainly within the jail, it's uh, in the be behavioral health program, it's around 30%. And, and of that 30%, are they like 
the worst of the worst offenders or it does it is it just just a smattering of 30 percent I don't know, but I think it's probably a smattering because sometimes it's people just don't want to get out of bed sometimes. And so we try again. Sometimes it's people really don't want help. Um, and of course, they they can refuse help uh, in the jail. And um, so, yeah, it's a smatter. I don't know about charges or what their charges would be or anything like that. Thanks. So I'm going to I'm going to try something with you all. If, if you turn on your screen and you raise your hand button and then you go like this, can you see the signal? That means I have a direct response to that question. And then I will, you get bumped up then if you have a direct response, all right? So anybody have another direct response to this topic? Yeah, David, go ahead. A couple of things about that. One is as a teacher at the jail, my experience has been if I ask individuals at the jail, hey, would you like to go to college or would you like to finish high school or would you like to do your GED? They say no, until they've been brought into a class, we build rapport, and then suddenly they're very excited about those things. I'm wondering if that's a barrier. Um, secondly, we are in the process of developing a, a, a way of asking inmates questions about what they would want. Um, and I wonder if that question can be refined um, a little bit so that, so that we may ask um, maybe, it, yeah, and we're going to field test our questions, but maybe that seems like data we might want to try and get from people in the jail and as well as maybe barriers that officers on the floor might be able to identify to some of those things. Great. Thank you. Okay. Let's keep moving. Erica, you're next. Thoughts about gaps, needs. De Dean had a, Dean had a, I, I saw Dean, Dean had a response. Oh, Dean's got a response. Another response on this gap. Go ahead, Dean. <laughs> Thanks. Good eye. Good, everybody help. We're all helping here, Dean. Well, so I, I guess I would just say in the community, it's sort of the analog to the teachable moment. When a person discovers or realizes they've got an issue, they're in a moment of crisis. If an assessment can be made available to them, you know, at that moment, and perhaps even where they are, rather than having them take two buses to get to the mental health center, for example, there's a much greater likelihood they're going to accept that intervention because they experience the moment as a crisis they need help with. Uh, yeah, good one, thank you. Okay, anything else? All right, Erica, you're up. Thanks, Holly. I just uh, first wanna thank this team. I, um, I think this work is super, super helpful and instructive. I think we could benefit from gap analysis in almost all of the systems that um, could use improvement. And this is a, a great start. I, my challenge in all of this is when I look at these priorities, uh, there's relative priority within each of these and priorities um, priorities that may look like a three in one category that are still higher priority than a one or a two in one of the other intercept points. And, um, and I appreciate that you that you sort of laid out some recommendations about high priorities. And yet I still really struggle with um, where we continue to be on this hamster wheel and the time horizon we're using to think about um, potential involvement in the criminal justice system and not thinking for, it, we're thinking about it sort of more like imminent um, potential for involvement in the criminal justice system. And because, and this is, please trust that I'm not criticizing the team. It's really a philosophical question about where do we say we start with, with addressing the underlying factors that could in 20 or 30 years result in someone um, having a connection to the criminal justice system, rather than thinking about this from an imminent or very likely involvement. And I think that's a challenge. And of course, this group is really focused on the criminal justice system now and trying to get off the short-term hamster wheel. But I don't think unless we really think about that earlier time horizon, we're ever really going to stop having these conversations about how we get to the root causes. And um, so that's my public health plug. And I know that my colleagues agree with me, but it's just, um, it's hard to see us continue to be in this space where we're, we're reacting uh, to, to, imminent, to imminent involvement. 
Yeah, thank you. It, it, it reflects actually, I don't know if you all remember on one of our first meetings and we talked about, don't we need to have a, like a minus one and a minus two even before the zero? Do you guys remember that? So yeah, I think that that perspective is definitely in the room. Thank you for voicing it. Arlene. You're muted, Arlene. Excuse me. Um, in answer to Erica, I wanted to say that the task force has been addressing uh, prevention uh, all the way along. We keep talking about it. We keep bringing it up. We know the state is now offering more counselors in the public schools. This is an opening, an opportunity, but where are the family counselors? In behind the counselors, to grab those families immediately and start addressing their problems. That's one thing. The other thing is a suggestion that I've had from the beginning, which is 24 seven urgent care uh, program, which will address especially fast assessments. We need something that is immediate and there for absolutely everybody. Crisis stabilization does a good job, but it's limited. We don't, uh, law enforcement and emergency services are wanting, uh, and also uh, the outreach programs are wanting a place to take people. Where are they gonna go if they need help right away? We need that care 24 seven. And the programs that I've seen that do this are not actually 24 seven. They're like five days a week and so forth. It's not sufficient. If you're gonna do it, you do it really thoroughly. The issue of um, how we look at these systems to me is like a big web of connections. This is a, a um, an enormous web of connections with broken parts, broken parts, missing parts. We're trying to fill in those parts by this work that we're doing. And the work is very good. It's going well. It's not gonna be perfect. It won't be perfect when it's done either, but it's so much farther along the way than where we have been in all this time. So um, it's very exciting. Good work. Great, thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna jump to, uh, when I see the lineup to the people who haven't had a chance Barry, to speak. Barry has a back and oh, forth. Oh, a direct response. And just for everybody to bear in mind, we have four areas to discuss. So we're going to take about only about three more minutes on this one. Okay. Remember, jot down if if you have more to say, get your piece of paper and jot it down because then you can add it to the survey after the meeting. All right. We don't want to lose it. Uh, Perry, you had a direct response. Go ahead. You bet. Um, uh, actually, just uh, just really appreciated Arlene. Uh, you know, certainly have sat in meetings with you and and you know expressed those concerns in terms of the resources. And I know that you have a history and background in terms of working with folks. You know, directly in terms of uh, uh, detox and some of those um, pieces. And so we actually added uh, uh, two intercept zero in uh, um, tier C doesn't exist yet two programs sort of trying to get our, our, our hands around that. Uh, one of them being the third bullet point down being a sobering center and the fifth bullet down being a 24 seven drop-in center for persons experiencing homelessness with behavioral health, employment, you know, case management services and needs. I don't know that we described that as well as we needed to. Um, uh, urgent care, you know, being just kind of a definition and so forth, but I just wanted to make reference to your voice was heard and um, and there was a real effort to uh, to list that as well. Um, and I think the team agreed with that. So thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, my Lisa, where'd thank you go? You. Thank you, I'm here. I, I let my hand go down. Um, I, a couple gaps I would identify is, and I'm the chief deputy public defender for anyone on here I haven't met before. Um, 
I, we identify serious delays in the jail for mental health services, folks that are on long, long wait lists, weeks and weeks and weeks before they're seeing a provider in the jail. Um, they're, and I can provide more details, but I'll identify that. Also, um, there's a new mental health sentencing alternative that's available. There are gaps in um, what can be done to prepare the necessary documentation for someone to participate in that sentencing alternative. It's a very important alternative. It deals with uh, the persons on DOC super supervision for the period of that alternative, but it avoids incarceration and avoids prison sentences, but we don't have resources to get the psychiatric evaluations necessary. Lifeline Connections who contracts with the jail to provide mental health services does not contract to provide that kind of service, and there, there is no one. It's basically an unfunded mandate that alternative, but it's one that could significantly impact our jail population. Also, just I put in a plug, we have two excellent behavioral health specialists at our office, but we could use more. We have investigators, but they're not trained in the mental health field, and we need more resources like that in our office as well. Thanks. Oh, great feedback. Thank you. Okay, so I see a couple more hands. So uh, Michael, Daniel, and Bro, I'm going to ask you to just jot down your thoughts hang on to them. We're going to jump to the next area. If we have time at the end, I'll pick you back up, but let's, let's go to the next area. So super, super feedback, you all. Great, great stuff. Okay. We're on jail base. So intercepts two and three requires adequate space when we're thinking about facilities. This is something to bear in mind. So insufficient number of intensive case managers for the jail, lack of access to timely competency restoration process, need increased access to mental health and substance use disorder assessments on demand, no waiting, and need for treatment for methamphetamine dependency. Those were the priorities identified so far. So do these needs and gaps match your sense of what the priorities are? And are there other high priority needs and gaps that you think are important for us to consider? Got that? All right. Great, let's jump in. We have, for each one, we have about 10 minutes just to give you a sense. So dialing it in. Yeah. Um, Wendy, go ahead. Um, I'm Wendy Jones, I'm the chief of the county jail under the sheriff's office. In addition to the gaps that were listed there, one of the things that we run into repeatedly is the backup of the court system. Um, when somebody is evaluated initially for whether or not that they may be competent to be part of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. then that report gets turned into the court system. And it we have been seeing, especially seriously over the past couple of years, repeated continuances by the attorneys and the court between the time that evaluation is made and the time a decision is made, yes or no. When they get back from hospital after they've waited for long periods of time to get restored down at the hospital, the same thing will happen is that they will come back and they may come back on month one and it may be two or three months later before they go to court for that determination to occur. What happens in the interim frequently, although not always, is the individual will refuse to follow the treatment regimen that was set down at Western State Hospital. We do not have the ability to compel somebody to um, submit to treatment involuntarily. And so what will happen is then the poor public defender's office get a phone call from us and let them know you need to come and talk to your client again. They've now decompensated and we have to start this all over again. Um, out of the 19 people that we've had that are in jail and have been in jail for longer than a year, I think eight of them would classify out as seriously mentally ill. And it's no one person's part, fault. It's an overburdened criminal justice system, but it is not just getting them to restoration. It is then the legal process that have to happen around both getting that determination and then getting the medical diagnosis supported by the court system. So it is a frustration for everyone involved. And it is just part of as Maya touched base, inadequate number of resources. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, Doug. So I agree with um, 
you know, the recommendations already. And obviously Wendy highlighted some of the, the ongoing needs in the jail. And to speak to, to Erica's point, ideally, if early prevention and voluntary treatment works at, uh, at zero and, and diversion at, at uh, you know, intercept one, you know, hopefully those people don't enter the criminal justice system. But, um, you know, talking about we're already to a point where, you know, those programs don't work for everybody. And in the interest of public safety, we're to a point where some people find themselves um, in a position where they get arrested and they need to be uh, in the jail. So really one of the main charges of this committee is for those people that find themselves in a situation where in the interest of public safety, they need to be in jail, what additional services? There's a lack of resources within the jail, behavioral health, uh, to, you know, there's a, a lack of medical services in the jail. And a lot of it comes down to inadequate facilities and just not enough space. And then adding those resources for those that, that have to be there. And again, we should always, it, it's, not a, it's not an or. We should continue to work on additional resources at lower levels of the intercept model. But we have to, we have to continue to look at uh, providing an adequate jail and the services for those that find themselves in that situation. Thank you. Cliff. You got it? Cliff, to, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Okay, you hear me? <laughs> now we can. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. So let me introduce myself real quick. Um, I was a deputy with Black County Sheriff for 27 years. I spent the first four plus years working in the jail. I was the last person that was hired when the jail was still on the sixth floor of the courthouse. So I have a little bit of familiarity with the jail and with dealing with um, with people that are arrested. Um, I was also the chair or co-chair on the jail yes committee that worked on getting a tax uh, passed so that we could build a new jail. And the sole purpose of that tax was for the new jail. Um, I got on this committee because I want to see the jail built. I want to see it built to an adequate size to house all these different programs. Um, you will get an email from Kathy in the next couple of days that has two attachments. One is a video that was made in 2012 that talks about uh, Judge Schneider is on there, uh, Sheriff Elfo, and a couple other people talking about the need for space. As the population of the jail increased, the programs got taken away because there wasn't room to have the programs. So a lot of these programs that we're talking about, they've already been in place at one point. At one point, we had a re-entry mental health counselor. Where's that? We don't have those things anymore because we don't have the space in the jail. We need to build a new jail. And um, so there's, there's a lot of important things. Um, one of the things that you'll get is behind me, I have a uh, timeline that was made, it starts in 2000, um, no, in uh, 1983 and goes to 2012. Um, there'll be a zip file on the email that you get that has this in little sections because I couldn't put the whole thing on. But I wanted to emphasize, you can, if you take a minute to look at that, you will see the history of the jail and how the overcrowding how the unsafe conditions and all those other things have gone into eliminating a lot of the programs that we want to talk about and that we're trying to get implemented once again. Um, so I want to encourage the, com uh, the committee to encourage the county council to put the jail on the ballot this year. I don't think we can keep waiting and putting it off for um, you know, another year or two years, whatever it's going to take. This is going to take time to build the jail, but we need the space to implement the programs that we're talking about. And so I think that kind of fits with what you're asking. 
Great. Thanks, Cliff. Okay, Jackie, and then we should shift gears. Jackie. Uh, yeah, thanks, Cliff. I, I just wanted to let you know that we do have a reentry case manager again in the jail. Um, but your point is well taken about the space. I mean, the jail was never designed with treatment in mind, and we can't conduct any quality of care in the jail for people needing behavioral health services by talking through food hatches or on the phone. We have to be able to meet with them person to person in a confidential space. And that's that's largely what's not happening in the jail right now. So, um, so yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. but that's because there's not space and the new jail was yeah. designed, was designed to have room for those space programs. Yep. Yep. I'm so, totally agreeing with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay. Good. Y'all ready? Should we move? Okay, next topic. We're now on re-entry. So could you pop that up? There we go. So the two priorities that I've been identified so far, I can just barely imagine the work for the committee to get drilled down to the priorities. My goodness. Okay, insufficient capacity staff of jail and community-based re-entry services just not enough capacity and Medicaid insurance is suspended at, a, at the point of incarceration. And that delay in reinstating benefits creates a gap in transition from jail to community-based services. So this was identified as a second key priority here. So re-entry, intercept four, let's um, go ahead and open it up for comments. Uh, when you think about the re-entry point of intervention, how does that match your sense of priorities or what else would you add in there? Yeah, Dan. Are you saying the slide kind of read a little bit different than the way that you had just read it? Is you, it said a delay, it made it sound like there's a delay after the person um, exited the jail, maybe a, a temporary delay of like, you know, a week or two or whatever, but that also caused like a even further um, issue on accessing Medicaid. Is that how did I read that correctly or? Yeah, Stephen, would you, I felt like you articulated this at a meeting I was at really well. Do you wanna, or? Is, yeah, I, I, I can try. Um, Dan, my understanding, and I think uh, Dean and Perry and Jackie are, are also pretty expert at this. Um, if you have to start the paperwork to uh, re-enroll in Medicaid only at the point that you, uh, uh, get out of jail or right on the verge of that, it's going to take a little while before your Medicaid is in, in effect. And so you don't have coverage for that initial period. Um, and, and I think that's what, what they're pointing to is there is a gap, a potential gap where you can't access the services. Now, I'm, I'm not sure why that is uh, because you can get retroactive coverage. So it may have to do with the healthcare plans and how, how they uh, manage the coverage. They've been given basically uh, a free pass on how they, how they do that. Um, so there are other people at least as knowledgeable as I about Medicaid enrollment and, and maybe they have different perspectives on that. Somebody else want to jump in on that of what they, how they understand this issue? I, I, I think- see Maya. I see Maya. Maya. Oh, okay, go ahead Maya. Go ahead. Thanks. Just briefly, this is a huge problem for the mental health sentencing alternative, for instance, because mm -hmm. PACT is the only program that will kind of do a, a Band-Aid where they, they understand that folks coming out of the jail don't have immediate coverage and they will kind of eat it. But um, no other programs do that. So even though there may be openings at, say, Lake Whatcom or CMAR or Unity, none of them will work with, we can't get any of our inpatient, our in-custody folks out because they don't have, we can't sign them up for any services because they don't have the insurance. Got it. Okay. So I just want to say we're starting a reentry system coordination meeting, and this is a problem that actually should not be happening because it, uh, it should have been fixed by a law about two years ago that allowed for people to be made Medicaid eligible so that the moment they step out the door, they're ready to go. Um, and so we're going to tackle this as one of our issues uh, and why this is happening here locally. Um, as needed, but uh, it definitely should not be happening. And, and to me, it's more of a systems issue 
but if there's more to it than that, like maybe more people or bodies are needed to help provide a conduit, then we'll come up with that as well. But I think Wendy has something to say about this as well. Great. Wendy, I'm going to take you next. Uh, remember to be uh, everybody really succinct. And it's a good example of how the system's always changing, right? As we're trying to do this. Go ahead, Wendy. There is a system set up. The MCOs, the managed care organizations that manage Medicaid in the state of Washington, scrape data from the from WASPIC, Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, which is where all the data from every jail in the state of Washington goes when somebody is arrested. It also collects the data when those individuals are released. The MCOs are very, very efficient about going in and pulling the data once somebody is booked. There is a 24 to 72 hour delay at the time they're released before the MCOs find that data. So the system is set up. It may need to be revised or refined so that they are as efficient in picking up the release information as they are the booking regulation or booking information. And that is the thing that's causing the lapse in between the time they get out and the Medicaid is automatically reinstated. There are some folks who don't have it and the reentry specialists in the jail are usually pretty good about picking that up and getting the paperwork done. So that's what a big part of this issue is. And thank you very much. And I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to excuse myself because I've got another commitment. If anyone has very jail specific questions, you're free to send me an email and I'll respond. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, Brel, you're up. Um, thanks. So um, I feel like this process, is, it's really hard for me to participate in some ways because like, I'm just trying to look at the, I'm looking at this as we go on my computer at the different uh, mm -hmm. columns. And there's so many on, things on here that I'm really curious about, like what they are, that I don't really understand what they are. And like, like I'm really interested in finding out more about like what kind of housing support people get um, in reentry and post incarceration community services. So like, yeah, I guess my question is like, is there a way, or also like there's this peer reentry specialist program is, is an, a suggestion for a program that's on existence. That seems super, super important to me, but like, I guess, yeah, I, well, my first comment on this is like, those two that are listed are great, but I think there's a lot more that are, should be big priorities personally, but but the other piece is like, is there some way that for those of us that aren't as familiar with all of these um, either suggestions or currently existing programs to find out more information about what they are? Great. Could somebody do a response specifically to that? Who, uh, who can respond to that question? I could respond to it in that, um, I Bro, if you want, to, if you want to meet with me one on one, I, I could probably help you understand some of the programs better, um, if that would be acceptable to you. I don't know that everybody wants the same level of understanding, uh, so just making Thank that off. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Definitely. Okay. Uh, I think actually, yeah, Maya, go ahead. Sorry, that was an old hand. That was an old hand. <laughs> okay, I think David, you're next. Just one tiny little gap on reentry, just from mm -hmm. years of totally unscientific data recent or collection at the jail is they keep telling me that who picks them up and drops them off where they're going is a major factor in recidivism. I mean, they, they keep telling me over and over and I imagine a ride to grandma's house may be a whole lot cheaper than reincarcerating them and stuff. So just saying some way of doing quick transport is a gap, I think. Great, great. Nice addition. Thank you, David. Atul, you're up. Uh, thank you. So uh, a theme that I see in uh, the actions or recommendations um, mm -hmm. based on the uh, sequential intercept model is advocacy. Um, and I'm um, wondering about how much this group has looked at from the behavioral health perspective um, throughout the sequential intercept process, uh, 
what is the nature of advocacy because um, this meeting has allowed me, and I'm sorry for being long-winded, Holly, but I, I've got some specific things I'd like to offer. And when I've been thinking about process and systems, I've been recognizing, at least from my perspective, it seems that the criminal justice system is like a marble maze where uh, the people and the system are like marbles. And in that marble maze, there's all these different organizations and people who work for local government. And they feel that they have, uh, they all have a desire to help the situation get better, but they have only limited touch points or uh, using the sequential intercept model lingo, intercepts. Hmm. And what I'm wondering is to what extent what we really need to focus on is advocacy that is persistent, that goes beyond one touch point that stops treating people like marbles and starts treating people like people. Um, and so uh, I wanted to bring that up. It's more an observation than a question. So uh, forgive me for that as well. No, it's, it's good. You're, you're answering the question. So can you give an example uh, briefly, a tool of what, at, when you say advocacy, what it would look like? Uh, trying to get someone assigned to be looking at a particular person engaging with the uh, justice system as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's kind of following the person along, almost like yeah. a case management relationship. Like, is yeah. that what you're... And who doesn't need to be a lawyer, who doesn't need to be paid $100,000 right. a year or more, who doesn't mm -hmm. need to have uh, special offices that are paid for by the county, who mm -hmm. none of that infrastructure is, but just someone who is acting in the capacity of advocacy. And there's lots of people obviously who are uh, non-jurisdictional or uh, who, are, who volunteer in that capacity um, as well. Great, thank you for that. So I'll take a direct comment if you've got it, otherwise we're gonna move on. Direct response? Michael. Michael? DV SAS use what's called an advocacy counseling model. They're mm -hmm. not experts, they're not therapists, uh, but they're people who walk alongside survivors. I think maybe you're thinking about something like that. There are a lot of experts out there that need to provide help, but maybe you're referring to something more like that. And they're long-term companions with someone on their process. Yeah, great, more community-based. Dean, did you have one more comment here? And then are you good? Well, I guess I just would say that the, um... The Grace and Lead program, uh, I think, come closer to what you're talking about, Atul, because they really aren't forced into just sticking with silos of eligibility or certain points in a, in a service continuum. Um, and, and so advocacy, I, I think, uh, and, and there are maybe others on the meeting who could speak more to this directly, uh, Tommy uh, from the Lead program, for example. But... I think advocacy is certainly one of the elements of what they regard as their service responsibility in working with their, uh, okay. their folks. But, it, but it's a narrow, you know, it's a, a group of people who is not a large group of people. Right, right, thank you. Maya? When you're discussing people who are in a pretrial situation, I mean, their attorneys are gonna constrain their communication to some extent. So. I, I have to say that working through our office with behavioral health specialists who work with us is a really productive way to address this because there are going to their attorneys when they're accused people are accused of crimes their attorneys are necessarily going to advise them not to con, you know to limit their communications to some extent and so like we have a relationship and we can we can bring that if we have the resources thanks nice Stark. Yeah, I, I realized that the question that prompted this was uh, uh, predicated on it didn't have to be an attorney, but I mean, the advocates that you're talking about are the people in our office. So we are the ones that are on scene within hours or days of somebody's arrest. And uh, what, what I've seen uh, the practice of public defense evolve to over the years is a more holistic uh, handling of, a, of an individual where we're concerned with uh, many more things than just guilt or innocence and incarceration. I mean, we involve 
ourselves in, in our clients' treatment programs, our, our clients' lives, uh, occasionally housing, um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And, um, you know, the problem that we've got is that, you know, we have caseload standards that we have to comply with. And those caseload standards were uh, set by, you know, the ivory tower down in Olympia, you know, based on the expectation of what it would take to handle a criminal case. And as our practice has expanded and, you know, and, and gotten, so we're involved in more and more aspects of our clients' lives. Uh, those standards are somewhat unrealistic and, and the resources in our office are inadequate to take care of the numbers of people that we have to have this holistic approach to. So, um, you know, and I, I'm not necessarily saying we need to double the size of the public defender's office to solve this problem, but there needs to be there needs to be resources, uh, you know, out there to cover to cover these issues. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in my view, uh, they aren't there at this point. Um, you know, as Maya indicated earlier, we're running around trying to get all these people figured out in this mental health sentencing alternative that the legislature created, which could be a huge benefit to the sheriff and the jail in terms of, you know, people not serving time in in the facility either the jail or prison you know if we could only figure a way to, to adequately get it off the ground because we have we have resources that we can turn to so you know it's from our perspective uh, the people do have advocates but they need more resources to adequately do the job this sounds like such a great area to think more more holistically about and to really get into depth about what what does create that really humanized experience and not just marbles moving through a system? And what's the capacity and interconnection to make that possible? So keep thinking about that. We're gonna to jump to our last one. If you didn't get to speak, you have to jot it down. You're gonna get a chance, but we do wanna do the last one before we walk out of here. So uh, Kathy, can you pop that slide up? We're on the, you know, gosh, all these are so good. So we're on the post-incarceration, which again is a big circle. So you guys can read it yourself. You got it? Lack of permanent supportive housing, need for dedicated housing, need for residential treatment. Got it? Okay, good reading. Let's open the floor. Okay, who has not spoken yet? Somebody who hasn't spoken yet. You get to go. Mm, come on, guys. What other priorities? What are their gaps? What are the needs and gaps that match your sense? Of Come on, Arty. Important? Yeah, Jack, you get to go. I thought so. Thanks. Uh -huh. uh, Jack Ovenier, co chair of the Incarceration Prevention Reduction Task Force. Now, I was looking at the fourth one, and this included the methamphetamine treatment, correct? Mm -hmm. So, all I want to say to that is um, both anecdotally and you know, through uh, my affiliation in the 12 step reality, both in Whatcom County, but really across the world and certainly the United States, uh, this is something we see over and over again. But I also want to highlight, I don't, and Dean or others may know more, or Erica, I don't know that there is a, uh, a great protocol. Individuals vary so, so widely, but the reality is some extremely aberrated, um, psychotic looking behavior happens uh, with psychosis from from meth use. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's something to really be aware of. And it also, both anecdotally and I think with evidence, seems to take a long time. My own experience in watching people, it's often 12 to 18 months before somebody with a long history of meth, particularly if they're living on the street, is capable of working, showing up, uh, showing up for court, uh, and behaving in ways that are consistent with um, what we would expect from people in society. So that was just all I wanted to say. And I want to welcome our new member, Teresa Bostetter. Thank you for, for, for joining us. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jack. Anybody else who hasn't had a chance to speak yet in our meeting today? Okay. I'll go with the raised hands who we have. Oh, wait, Eve, you're the winner. Let's, it's so glad you spoke up. What's your thought? Thanks. Yeah, I guess one thing I wanted to speak to is what is what is permanent supportive housing actually look like in our community? Um, in my work at uh, Northwest Youth Services, 
we're seeing young folks being evicted from permanent supportive housing. And to me, that doesn't speak to a permanent supportive housing program. So just I think it'd be really important to be clear of what we're considering permanent supportive housing and like what processes are needed to make sure that folks stay housed when they need that kind of support. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Michael. Yep. Thank you. So on re-entry, I'm wondering, if, is, is there a missing piece that has to do with barriers to employment? I can think mm. of three general areas, job skills, um, behavioral health challenges, but what about just like having a record? Are there mm. programs that help people get around the fact they now have a record? The only thing on there I saw was access ID, because often if you don't have an ID, you are out of luck. So that's in a program I think that can get you a job. Um, is there an employment piece here? I don't know. Um, it seems to me that's one of the challenges of reintegrating. Right. Excellent flagging. Okay. Arlene, I think you were up. And then Jack, you're next. And then um, Dean. Sir, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to answer, Michael, um, in the previous program that was run by uh, Goodwill, uh, uh, there was a very strong uh, job component and uh, training for jobs and training for work. Uh, of course, it could have been expanded because there were a lot of people anxious to take that training. And also I spoke to the person who worked in that program previously. And what she said to me is that there are companies that are willing to take employees who have been incarcerated. And what is needed is for someone to uh, get a list together of places where that can be done. But so yes, that's a good suggestion. And it definitely has has been looked at but, and, and been functioning before. Great, thank you. Dean, did you still wanna jump in there? No. Yes. Uh, Mike, go ahead and then we'll see. Maybe Dean's having some trouble with his audio. All right, I was waiting because I know I presented and I already got a chance to talk. But I, you know, I think just teasing out a theme that I see that mm -hmm. so many folks in our jail. I mean, obviously today we're talking about folks affected and beset by behavioral health um, issues that they they need they need support in, they need help with. Um, and mm -hmm. what we find is that, um, and Eve, you talked a little bit about housing and how important that is. That's so critical. We don't get better when we're homeless and on the streets. And the high prevalence of folks in our jail who are also homeless, who when they discharge, as my, and as folks said, who comes to pick them up, right? Maybe nobody. And maybe there's nowhere to go. And, you know, I think you can see, at least housing is near and dear to my heart. I've been in that world for a really, really long time. And it is, a, it is an area of great pain about how many of our community members live unsheltered. Um, but when I come to this subject and I think about how critical that is in, in having a place to land outside and to keep us going back from, as, as a tool mentioned, being a marble and a mill and then going back through, I just can't underscore how important it is. And then really tailored and robust services, right? So, you know, Eve's talking about sometimes people in, in, in housing, they need really robust services, right? So permanent supportive housing really should have the robust services for folks and we need it to scale in our community. So mm -hmm. I just see this as huge. I agree with the group that it put the importance on that because I think it's one of the critical things um, to help in, in, in really any situation improvement for somebody's life, but certainly to interrupt the cycle of going in and out of a criminal legal system. Fantastic. Um, David, go ahead. Sorry to speak so much. Um, when I when I first got to the jail, one of the pieces I found missing in King County, they have the where to turn guide that somebody can turn to to find out what the resources are so they can help themselves. I think we have a gap, like as I hear things, um, like there is a second chance employer list that's held by the BFET folks. And there, I mean, some of this stuff is already known and have. We just don't in Whatcom County and surrounding areas have a great one-stop shop resource for that, mm -hmm. like the where to turn guide model from King County. That might be a gap. Great, thank you. Perry? 
actually kind of connects to both Very what Michael bad. was saying and, and David, um, uh, just in regard to uh, that we had tossed that idea around, uh, included some items in Intercept 3 and in Tier C, programs not in existence, and really recognizing that piece, you're absolutely correct. Um, that some specific resources and tools relative to everything from possibly uh, uh, crafting a, a resume to literally who are the employers and et cetera. I know that Wendy Jones knows quite a bit about this from history, that it was in place, that there were some challenges and some struggles. I don't know if it was available space within the jail and some of those kinds of uh, challenges that, uh, uh, that brought about the the fact that that uh, program had been extinguished, but um, I really agree with you and just wanted to say something. Great, thanks. Okay, Brell, last words, super short, please. Okay, um, yeah, so as far as the category of programs recommended but not in existence, um, just wanted to briefly mention this organization called Planting Justice out of the Bay Area. They have a 0% recidivism rate. They combine um, living wage jobs, peer support, um, and uh, doing like organic nurseries and how uh, food security in their communities it's just like this incredible program i think like programs like that that combine all of the things that are needed into a holistic reentry program would be really beautiful but maybe that's okay. what I do, but that's what i'd like to see oh that's great thank you for that yeah very yeah just very quickly Brel, can you send us a link or a, a url or something to kathy so we can get that out yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, gang, we're on the home stretch. Uh, Kathy, if you could pop the slideshow back up, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping and then, and then Barry will close us out. So um, first, before, before anything else, I just want to acknowledge, and, and we can all give a hand to Mike Parker, Jackie Mitchell, Perry Mowry, Dean White, like an amazing, the Begat, our beloved Begat team, they have worked so hard with, with Marty's help, Marty Solomon, my colleague, amazing. It's just like the hours to try and get us down into some, some information we can work with and the analysis. Thank you guys, really awesome. So here's our wrap up for today. We have a couple uh, meetings coming up that you might wanna join in on. And then make sure you've got on your calendar our SAC meeting number four is uh, we want to do a work session where we'll have more time to actually like get into the juice of this. So I want to take down the slide for a minute. And I, this is your question. Here's the million dollar question these days. Should we try and do it in person? We do it, of course, hybrid. You know, we'd have. But here's the question. I want to see a show of hands or you can use your little raise hand button. Would you come on July 14th in concept to an in-person meeting in a nice big space? I'm waiting for your hands. Let's see. Is it, do we have enough of us who would want to do that for us to try and organize that? Actually use your friends. Would you use your raise hand? That is even better. Okay, raise them up. Would you come? Would you want to come to in person? Okay, so about one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I'm seeing about fourteen of us. Okay, good. So we'll have to think about that. We might even, Marty, we might even want to put that in the survey if we have to do that. Okay, slide back up. So some of us would. COVID is so tricky, right? You don't know how it's going to fly. And let's hear it for the health department. <laughs> what a time to be working in public health. Holy moly. Okay. Uh, SAC homework. We uh, have already prepared a, a great little survey. So please respond to it. Take your notes from the moments that you wanted to talk and we ran out of time and get those in the, in the survey. It's got open-ended questions. So you can just plug them in. And I also want to, and then you, like I said before, you'll be able to comment on the sim as well if you'd like to get into that level of the of the material. Then we have an optional opportunity to review the questions to ask people incarcerated and working in the jail. So David is working on that project 
um, since he's interfacing with the jail right now to kind of help think about how we can survey, how we can do some key informant interviews to get more information from people who are actually having a lived experience, either working or incarcerated. So please let us know if you would like to review that, that survey design or the research design. And lastly, the Justice Project website, remember that we've got that up. So for your comments, to make sure you're tracking, you know, there's, there's just a lot of material to be aware of. So I thank all of you for taking the time to just try and, you know, we're trying to cut, bring together people who are very much subject matter experts and we're all coming from different perspectives. So it's, uh, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot to comprehend. So I really want to honor everybody's time and effort in that. Okay, so it is two minutes, one minute to close. Uh, Atul, I see your hand up. Was that to meet in person or did you have one more comment? Nope, I, I just was keeping it up. Okay, far out. Great, so Barry, I'll turn it over to you. And you can- Okay, thanks, Holly. A great job facilitating us today, thank you. And I'd really like to, first of all, thank everybody here that's on this meeting. Uh, this is super important work for our community and your input and your, uh, uh, how closely you're paying attention to everything that's going on is really critical. And again, I wanna thank you. Also wanna thank our BEGAT team they put in a lot of work to uh, present this to us today. I'd like to give them a, a big round of applause uh, and also thank the planning team uh, that helped put this together because it, it's a lot of work. And uh, we will see you all again on July 14th. Uh, we are adjourned. Thanks again. Thanks all. Take care.